Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Guru Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. We're on location this week at Kew Gardens and I'll declare my interest because I'm on the board of trustees here and I thought that the rather beautiful but echoey Marion North Gallery would be the perfect setting for my guest this week. Michael Pollan writes about the things we put in our bodies, mostly food but also drugs mostly derived from plants. Time magazine describes him as one of the most influential people in America, but his views are controversial because he examines the effects of all these drugs on our minds and our bodies. So I should remind you that, of course, drug abuse has caused huge numbers of lost lives and ruined lives. And please don't listen to this and decide to try anything at home. Michael does this under very careful circumstances. But it's a fascinating listen, and I hope you enjoy the interview. I mean, the the really interesting thing for a man who writes about plants um, and science is that you're not a scientist. No, I'm not. Uh, I I am strictly an amateur. I neglected to study science in university. I began my writing career writing about what was happening in my garden, which I realized was a really interesting laboratory to explore our relationship to the natural world. Um, you know, we, in a garden, you're, you're, you're working with these domesticated plants, and we have altered them in important ways, but, it, but I, I began to see how they altered us also. And I got this idea at a very specific moment. I was planting potatoes in my garden, and this apple tree that's in my garden was just buzzing with the attention of bees. And it occurred to me as I was, uh, you know, digging little holes for these pieces of potato, that I had something in common with those bees. Um, I was doing work for this plant. Um, And in the same way the bee has been manipulated by the apple tree to pay it visits, the bee has no idea that it's been duped into, um, you know, penetrating that flower, and it thinks it's getting the best of that relationship, but in fact it's doing work for the plant and moving its genes around the, the garden and around the community. And I was doing the same thing. I'd been induced by my desire to grow potatoes to do exactly what potatoes wanted me to do, which is spread their genes. They used to be stuck in Peru, and now they're all over the world. So I have huge respect for plants and their power to use us. And and ever since, I've been exploring that relationship. I mean, are are they using us, or or is it a sort of symbiosis? Well, it's both ways. You know, we have a very negative view of addiction, uh, and where we have to do something, but symbiosis is everybody, everybody wins. It's, it isn't quite true that everybody wins, because sometimes we go overboard and we plant giant monocultures, whether it's coffee or corn, uh, maize, um, and that appears to suit the plant in the short term. It gets all this habitat and all this attention, but in fact it's a very dangerous way for anything to grow, because eventually some disease or insect will take over, and monocultures crash. They're very brittle. Um, But short of that, yeah, both parties win. What's interesting is that plants have done a brilliant job of figuring out what makes us tick and what we want. The plants that understand our desires are the ones that succeed. And the desire I've been most interested in the last couple books is this desire to change consciousness. That's a very weird thing. But for some reason, humans are not satisfied with everyday normal consciousness. And we do many things to alter it, many of them involving plants. And a certain class of plants that you might call uh, plant medicines or drug plants have figured this out. So plants are masters of biochemistry, right? And the reason is because they can't move, right? So they have to use chemistry to do everything, attract animals to help them, defend themselves. It's all about chemistry. And some of them hit on the precise molecular recipe to interact with neurotransmitters in the human brain, to mimic serotonin and things like that, which is quite remarkable. And so these plants that change our consciousness, and coffee and tea are great examples, have learned how to appeal to our desire to have the kind of clarity and energy and improved memory and endurance that caffeine gives us. And this has been their ticket to world domination. Is it clear what is a drug and what isn't, and what is a biochemical response and what isn't? Because eating makes, makes me feel better. <laughs> you yeah. know, we have comfort food, we have chocolate, we have oh, you know, yeah, all that no, sort of thing. You know. food, food affects us. I, we've only begun to study the, the, the psychological effects of food. But you see it if you have children. 
sugar is their drug, right? I mean, they, they, it changes their behavior completely. And so the line between food and drugs is very hard to draw. And, and indeed, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, it's regulated by the same body in the United States, basically de de defines a drug as something that isn't food that we consider a medicine. Well, that doesn't help very much. And the line between illicit and illicit drugs is also messy and constantly moving. It's, it's moving right now as cannabis is legalized in more and more parts of the U.S. And, um, uh, and psychedelics, too, are in the process of being redefined. Yeah, we're, so we're suddenly, in the last few years, getting to grips with the idea that these things that we've regarded as sort of hippie drugs or dangerous drugs may actually be really core to, to tackling what seems to be an epidemic of mental health. Yeah, I think it's one of the most remarkable things going on right now in, uh, in policy and in medical research. The fact that these substances that had a terrible reputation dating back to the 60s, a time when they were used in ways that were often reckless and led to problems, that we are realizing something that we actually knew in the 1950s and forgot, which was that psychedelic substances like LSD, psilocybin, which is the chemical in magic mushrooms, and, and, and MDMA, which is the chemical uh, also known as ecstasy, that these actually are powerful therapeutic tools. And research has been done, a lot of it in, in the UK at Imperial College, but uh, all over the United States, uh, that we are doing you know, controlled drug trials uh, to see if these substances could help deal with things like depression, anxiety, uh, the fear of death among the terminally ill, um, uh, addiction, obsessive compulsive disorder. And the results have been really uh, remarkably positive so far. I mean, these are smaller trials. We need, to, we need to scale up and do very large trials. But that's happening now, too. I mean, the modern world seems to have a very odd relationship with drugs. I mean, it, you know, it is changing, as you've just uh, d described. But um, for, for things that have been in use for thousands of years, do you have any sense of why we are so immature? <laughs> well, there's a lot. I mean, drugs is very, very complicated, right? I mean, these same substances can be uh, blessings or curses, depending on context, how they're used. You know, the Greeks really had it right. They called drugs pharmakon, and it meant both things. It could, be a, it could be a poison, and it could be a blessing. And you have to be able to hold some contradictory ideas in your head. Take the opiates, for example. We now have this tremendous opioid crisis. It killed more than 100,000 people in America last year. Uh, it's, it's one of the most serious public health problems related to drugs that we've ever had. By the same token, this same chemical produced by a plant, Papaver um, is, uh makes surgery bearable. Um, it would be very hard to, do, to, to undergo the aftermath of surgery without it. It makes the passage out of this life more bearable. It's, morphine is given to people at the end of life. And it, I think there's a tendency to moralize anything that changes consciousness. We just can't help but think it feels like cheating to take a chemical from nature and put it in our bodies and let it change consciousness. It somehow seems like a shortcut. But I see the use of plants to change consciousness as part of our engagement with the natural world, as much a part as eating plants. And are you writing because you want all of these things legalized? No, I wouldn't say that at all. I want all of these things researched. I want rational decisions about how to use them. I don't think blanket legalization of drugs, I don't think we're ready for it. I don't know that it would work very well. Um, I think you could have all sorts of problems. I believe even in the case of the psychedelic compounds that if they are to be decriminalized, which is happening very quickly in, in the US, it has to be with a very careful regime of rules and regulations. One of the lessons we learned from indigenous cultures who use psychedelics is that they don't do it casually, they don't do it recreationally. And you know, that's been going on for six or 7,000 years, indigenous cultures using these drugs. And I think we should study that example. So, so do you think something like ayahuasca tourism, where people just go, let's go and do it, it'll be fun, it'll be amazing, is the wrong approach? Well, it, you know, I think it all depends. I, I know people who have fantastic experiences and they find legit shamans and, um, and they're in a very safe environment. And then I know other people who go down there and hook up with some, uh, you know, crook or uh, sexual abuser and have horrible experiences. So I think, you know, it's one of the dangers of having an unregulated underground. Because when it comes to 
the criminality of drugs. I mean, you have this amazing quote in your essay on opium um, from one of um, Richard Nixon's policy yes, advisors. Yes, John Ehrlichman. John Ehrlichman, um, who was interviewed by a journalist in the 90s. I mean, Ehrlichman was... I mean, he'd, he'd gone to jail after Watergate and all of that. We should just And he was say, a very but, top advisor. I mean, yeah. he was his domestic policy advisor. I mean, he says, you want to know what this was really all about? Um, he says, we had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. I mean, that's just an astonishing... I know. I, know. I mean, that, that is one of those moments where the curtain is peeled back and you understand what's really behind something like the drug war, which was presented to us as a public health effort, right? That the drugs were the scourge of America's youth and they were... They were, you know, addicting people and hurting people in various ways. But in fact, it was a political campaign. And um, the result, of course, has been the incarceration of hundreds of thousands of African Americans in, uh, in, in the U.S. So ha having, having looked at opium and opiates, do you think we need, what do we need to change about our attitude towards opiates? Well, I think we have to understand that, um, you know, while the focus is on this drug war, the biggest public health problem related to drugs that we have had has been involving legal drugs, prescription drugs. The, the, the normal path of someone that leads to an opiate addiction is they first get opiates from their doctors. They, are, they have uh, workplace injury, back pain. You know, what OxyContin did, or what Purdue Pharma did, the, the company that introduced OxyContin back in the, the 90s, was convince the medical establishment that, one, this was a safer opiate, um, because it, it released more gradually, therefore harder to get addicted to, uh, that it was safer uh, in many ways, none of which was true, by the way. This, was, this has come out since as being, you know, marketing, you know, BS. And, um, uh, and the second thing they did was persuade the medical community that we were under-treating pain. At the time, you got an opiate after surgery, after dental work, but you didn't get one if you came in complaining about a back trouble or a workplace injury. And they, they, they vastly expanded the number of things for which you could get opiates. So people got these prescription opiates, uh, Oxycontin very often, huge amounts were sold. Some of them would get addicted and their doctor would cut them off, uh, not wanting to service an addiction, and then they would turn to the street. And it's at that point that they, they got drugs that got them, uh, you know, were contaminated with fentanyl or something like that, and that led to the overdose. So while the government has trained so much energy on the illicit drug market, the illicit drug market was creating this huge problem. There is a better way to manage this, and that uh, we need to take more of a harm, what's called a harm reduction approach. You realize there are people who are going to take drugs, you're not going to change that. Why not give them a clean needle so they don't spread disease? So, so do you think it's possible to live a functioning life long term forever, effectively, while being a, yeah, a heroin a drug user? addict? Yeah. Yes. There, yeah. There I mean, are, people do. There are people doing it. And if they have a steady, clean supply, people can go on for a very long time and... and, and Possibly indefinitely. You so, know, are you saying that that would be a more effective way to live than the way we live now with with, with criminalization? More effective. Uh, it would be safer for the individuals. Um, you know, is it a good thing for society? Probably not. There's a reason people get addicted, and, and best better to address the you know the causes of it. But it is always the criminal bit of it that that messes people up, isn't it? I've just made a film in St. Louis about fentanyl. Um, and there, again, it's, it's all, it's, it's people who are predict, you know, prescribed drugs who end up buying street heroin or street fentanyl, overdosing, trying to get off it and then going back on it. Yeah, no, they would have been better to stay on the legal drugs um, and then get therapy, you know, to get off it or improve their life circumstance to the extent that this, you know, government is willing to, to invest in that. I mean, a lot of it has to do with our disinvestment in a social safety net, um, you know, and, and what's going on in the economy and, and the rising rates of inequality and the, and the export of jobs overseas. 
I mean, there's so many factors involved. To just focus on the molecules is to miss the larger picture. Yeah. But, but, so, one, but one of the really exciting things about um, uh, psychedelics is that they can treat addiction. Um, and that's kind of a mind-blowing idea for some people, that you would take one drug to deal with another. But we have some really encouraging evidence now that psilocybin, which is being used for this purpose, is very effective in um, uh, breaking addictions to alcohol and cigarettes. How does this work? It, it's not a chemical effect. It's, a, it's an experiential effect. It appears that people have a kind of experience that gives them a new perspective on their lives. People, I, I interviewed many people in these trials, and they, they said it was like the camera had been pulled back further than it ever had, and I could see my life, and I could see what I was doing, and I could see how stupid it was. And they would have these almost banal um, uh, epiphanies that, you know, there's so many great things to do in life, so many amazing things to see, and I'm shortening my life with cigarettes, and that's so dumb. Now, that's an insight that probably most addicts have on a regular basis. Um, but there's something about having it under the influence of psychedelics that makes it really sticky. And this seems to allow people to break bad habits of both uh, behavior and thought. I mean, if, if that's true, why do some people then end up doing it a lot? I don't know. My own reaction after having a big psychedelic experience is not, when can I do it again? It's like, do I ever have to do it again? It's a very demanding experience. But even people who do it a lot are not doing it daily. Nobody can do that. I, I should describe what psychedelic therapy looks like, um, because it's not just the doctor gives you a pill and you go on your merry way. It's highly controlled, supervised experience. So there are two guides, facilitators or therapists, who are with you the entire time, they spend a couple hours preparing you for what's going to happen, helping you set an intention. What do you want to work on? Do you want to address an addiction or a bad habit? And they qualify to make sure there are no medical reasons you shouldn't be taking psychedelics, that you have no history of schizophrenia in your family, which does disqualify people. There are certain kinds of mental illness that don't mix with psychedelics, so they're not for everybody. Then during the experience, uh, they sit with you the entire time. You're wearing an eye shade which sounds weird to some people, um, and you're listening to music on headphones usually, which also sounds weird to people. Um, what's going on there is the eye shade um, encourages a very internal journey. So instead of kind of getting really engaged by the visual stimulus around you um, and looking at nature or a party or whatever it is, you go inside and you deal with internal issues. So, so do you have a sense of why, uh, or have you spoken to people about why um, they are talking about psilocybin and other psychedelics with regard to OCD, anxiety, yeah. and other mental health issues. The thinking is this. I mean, we don't have a, a, a rock-solid theory as to how they work. Um, the, the basic thinking is it is not just the chemistry, but it is the kind of experience the chemistry sponsors in your mind that allows you to let go of hab habitual ways of doing things. So... The mental illnesses or disorders that psychedelics appear to work best with, which includes anxiety, depression, OCD, uh, and addiction, if you think about it, at bottom, they're very similar phenomena. Or, or, or one way to think of it is they're different symptoms for the same kind of brain, which is a brain that is stuck, that is too rigid, that has too much order. And what the psychedelics do is um, essentially inject some disorder, some chaos into that brain, loosen it up, make it more plastic, and it allows you to give up uh, habits of thought, you know, the, the ruminative loops that people get stuck in, the, nar the destructive narratives we tell ourselves, you know, I'm unworthy of love, I'm worthless, you know, we get stuck in those stories, and the psychedelics seem to, to dissolve those and make the brain much more plastic. A beautiful metaphor that one of the scientists um, working at Imperial College uh, gave me when I was uh, reporting how to change your mind was, think of the mind as a snow-covered hill and your thoughts as um, sleds going down those hills, uh, that hill. Um, after a while, the grooves get so deep that whatever you try to do, you're going to get drawn into, the, into one of those grooves, and you can't go down any other way. This is what happens over time with habits of thought and behavior. 
And, and then he said, think of the psychedelic experience as a fresh snowfall that fills all the grooves. And suddenly you can take any path you want down the hill. So it makes the mind more plastic. And sometimes that's exactly what we need. And, and, and is it clear what the differences are between LSD, mescaline, yeah. psilocybin, all these things? Yeah, uh, to some extent. They have what the doctors call different phenomenologies. Um, they feel different. Um, LSD and psilocybin are very similar. Um, they work on the same receptor networks. And the reason that psilocybin is used in research rather than LSD is a practical one, um, which is that LSD is a lot longer experience. It can be like 12 hours. So for the, the, the workings of the lab, Psilocybin, which only takes four to six hours, is a lot more practical. Also, many fewer people have heard of psilocybin, so it's less likely to draw political flack. And um, we broadly think about drugs in three categories, I suppose. The sort of, you know, the, the, the painkillers, depressants of, right. of, of opium in your book. The stimulants. The, sti you know, the stimulants, which, now, that's what I wanted to come on to. So, so caffeine, is, is, is caffeine on a line with amphetamines, cocaine, I mean, are they all part of the same thing? Yeah, I mean, they, they arouse the, the, the mind and the body, um, so they are on a spectrum. There, there are differences, obviously. Caffeine is less dangerous. Caffeine has very few uh, negative health effects. I was surprised to learn. Um, coffee and tea are protective against many kinds of cancer, against cardiovascular disease, against stroke, against Parkinson's disease, against dementia. I mean, there's very positive research. And people have been looking for the negative on coffee and tea because something people like so much surely has to be bad for you. But it's not. Um, it appears that the one negative uh, about caffeine is sleep. Um, and if you have caffeine too close to bedtime, you will rob yourself of the most important kind of sleep, which is deep sleep or slow wave sleep. And this is the time, not when you're dreaming, but when you're really down deep, that your brain is doing a lot of taking out the trash, uh, organizing memories, deciding what to keep from the day. It's kind of brain cleanliness, sanit sanitizing. But there, um, there, was a, there was a piece of research recently that said some people aren't affected by caffeine. Did yeah. you, I mean... I think you could say that about any drugs. I mean, there are, people, there are people in these drug trials for psychedelics who just have these what are called dud trips. Nothing happens. Um, so there's, yeah, there's great variation in people's response to drugs. But, you know, caffeine is, I think it's a fascinating chemical. I think it's had a huge effect on history in, in, in the West. What's interesting about it, it's, it's one of the few psychoactives that we can date its arrival in society. Coffee and tea arrive in London in the 1640s, in that one decade. Chocolate, too, is a really good decade. And um, uh, so we have a sense of what life in England or France was like before caffeine and after caffeine. And it changed things. Um, it basically, before caffeine, people were drunk all the time or buzzed because alcohol was safer to drink than water. But then you moved to coffee and tea and people didn't have to drink if they didn't want to. There was a safer liquid. And, but it also sponsored a new kind of thinking, a new kind of work. You could, you know, it's very hard to imagine uh, an industrial revolution with everybody buzzed on alcohol. You need caffeine for, to have a night shift and an overnight shift, you know, to keep those machines going. It allows for a new kind of work. It allows for a new kind of thinking. I mean, which comes us back to uh, this whole question of the almost irrationality of which drugs we tolerate and allow within society and law and which ones we don't. Well, you know, if you look at it, we tend to permit the ones that make society and capitalism move more smoothly, that lubricate the wheels of the machine. If it makes you work harder. Yes. Caffeine, as it turns out, is a great way to get more work out of the worker. And the proof of this is the coffee break, right? I mean, think of this. Employers will, will give a drug to their employees coffee and tea, and then they'll give them time in which to consume it. Why do they do that? They do that because it makes them better workers. And this has been, you know, this is well known in, in, uh, in corporate life that the coffee break benefits the, uh, the owner. Disruptive drugs, though, such as psychedelics during the 60s, get banned. Um, They're a threat to the status quo. They were a threat to President Nixon. He believed that the anti-war movement was being fueled by LSD. And he may have been right. I mean, it was it was encouraging people to think for themselves and to check out on straight society. Um, 
And so he came out against it. But see, I think we're in the midst of a sea change now from viewing psychedelics as a disruptive force to seeing them as something that could help us with the much more disruptive force of mental illness. I mean, we have a, you know, we have a crisis around mental illness. Rates of depression, anxiety, suicide are through the roof, especially during the pandemic. And so now they're being reimagined as uh, something that could help society rather than undermine it. I, I mean, I probably oversimplified my question earlier in terms of why you're doing it, in, in, in terms of, you know, do you just want to legalise all of this? What, what, what do you think the activism is in your, in your work? Is, is it challenging us to think differently? Is, is that what you're about? Yeah, or? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get people to take a second look at these substances. One of the reasons in um, This Is Your Mind on Plants that I included caffeine is, like, there's a perfectly legal drug that most of my readers are involved with that probably don't think of it as a drug. So let's, let's revisit the whole question of what is a drug and why do you like to change consciousness? What's, what is dissatisfying about everyday normal consciousness that you want to change it? And why might that be a good thing? I mean, I think we all get stuck. We all have bad habits, right? Even if we're not mentally ill, we have habits we'd love to change. You know, we develop these algorithms that get us through the day, how we talk to our employer, how we talk to our wives, our kids. We don't even think about it. We just are automatic. And um, that dulls us to reality. And one of the things changing consciousness does is get you out of that. And then and something like caffeine, which I discovered when I gave it up, I, I realized, and this was kind of astonishing, that I, I didn't feel myself without caffeine. How weird to need a chemical produced by a plant to feel like myself. And I realized my default consciousness, the one that allows me to live the way I do and do my work and reporting and writing, is a caffeinated consciousness. Well, I mean, you, you say, I mean, once you realize that, you then don't want to be dependent on caffeine. Well, some people come out that way. I, I don't have a problem with it. I'm back on caffeine. Um, I, t I have one cup every day. It's one of the great pleasures of life. It really helps me with my work. I can think better. And that's not in my head. I mean, we have research that shows that if you uh, have a cup of coffee or tea after you've studied for an exam, you will do better on the exam. It will help you lock in those memories. Before. Did you say? No, have it after. After. Study. I know. I would have thought it was before, too. Um, the, the, the experiment that was done, you might find the same thing with before, but the experiment was done is like they give you a body of information to study. They give one group a cup of coffee or tea afterwards, and the other group doesn't get it, and then they test them on the information. And it's, it's remembered better. I mean, you said you weren't a sort of a, a, a young, you did an experiment with drugs yourself. Um, no, I mean... Um, so, so what brought you to this? I mean, was it just the natural progression from food, which is what you were first... It wasn't, famous? yeah, it wasn't a natural progression. I, I was writing about food, and my, my underlying interest, though, was this relationship with plants. But I was interested in other aspects, and one was this change of consciousness idea, which I'd written about in a book uh, many years ago called Botany of Desire. But then I started hearing about um, this research, and I heard that there was a trial underway at NYU uh, and uh, at Johns Hopkins where they were giving psilocybin in high doses to people who had a cancer diagnosis, and which seemed weird. I mean, would you want to trip after you got a terminal diagnosis? I can't imagine that. But these are people struggling with their fear of death and their, or their fear of recurrence and that they were getting relief and that they were having an experience that was profoundly spiritual that was kind of resetting their attitude toward death and in some cases had allowed people to die with incredible peace and equanimity. This seems so weird to me that I wanted to explore it and I began interviewing these um, volunteers or patients and their stories kind of blew me away. So I became increasingly curious, what is that like um, to have that powerful connection with something larger than yourself. So in, in, as I began working on it, it was inevitable that I would want to try it. I mean, this, this has been fantastic. We haven't even touched on food. We'll have to save that for another one. Um, but if you could change the world in any way, what would you do? Well, the way that's been on my mind is the potential of these psychedelic substances to help people change their lives and treat their mental illness. I, I think there's a tremendous potential in psychedelics to relieve human suffering. 
Um, and that's going to take more research and then changes in policy and changes in law and then making them accessible to the people who need them most, um, which is to say having the national health cover them. That might seem like a wild idea right now, that the National Health Service would offer psilocybin therapy to people or MDMA therapy. But mark my words, we are, all, we are five or ten years away from that happening. Here we have potentially, again, more research needs to be done, but here we have a substance that in a single experience or two experiences, not every day, um, can, can change your mind and um, in ways that will leave people much happier and uh, free them from the burdens they're carrying. There is a man, a 30-year-old man named Ben in the, in the Netflix series uh, who was uh, just chained to his obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, it was like a ball and chain he dragged around. He was, in, he was anxious all the time. There were so many things he couldn't do. Um, and he had a single experience with psilocybin and he just let it go and it's still gone. And um, to see his, the freedom this has given him um, is just, it will make you exuberant. It made me exuberant and it, and it made him exuberant. So I think we've got a powerful tool here and a lot of people in psychiatry recognize it. We have to go through the process. Um, we're going into phase three trials of psilocybin to treat depression. Uh, the work is being done. It's all being privately funded. Um, I, one way I'd like to see the world change is to have the government start funding some of this research um, because it, it offers enormous hope. Well, I was, was going to say, because actually where we are, Q, is one of the world's great scientific research bodies into fungi. Yeah. To be pursuing this. Well, it is, isn't there a, yet. is there a sort of an attitude change that needs to It's starting. The, the NIH, uh, National Institute of Health, which is the big funder of medical research in the U.S., just gave its first grant uh, to the researcher doing the OCD work at Yale. Um, that's, a, that's a sea change, and I think we're going to see more of that. But another thing we need to fund is plant research. There are many other psychedelic substances out there. We have to study these plants before they go extinct and see what's in them. I don't think people realize how many medicines they take were originally discovered by plants. The genius of plants and their biochemistry. Uh, aspirin, Taxol, which is a very important um, you know, chemotherapy. Um, there's so many, and there's so many still out there. And one of the valuable things about a place like Q is that that research is going on. Michael Pollan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Great pleasure talking to you. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to that. If you did, then you can watch it on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. And please do give us a rating or a review on whatever platform you're using so other people can find the podcast. Our producer is Nina Hodgson. Until next time, bye-bye.